The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. Thank you, Telly Olson. We are back. Jets, Jets, Jets in the zone, zone, zone. I'm Ralph Tycho, comfortably zoned radio network, and I've got Jet Mavens here. Um, Don Stokes and Bernie Rose. First, you, Bernie. How are you doing? Doing great, great, great. Glad to be back. Good, and uh, I'm glad to learn from you guys today. Um, I've been uh, out of the football business for a long time, and uh, as I talked about on the last show. I was a New York Titans fan first and then became a Jet fan and a fanatic. And um, these past few years, not just because of the Jets, um, I just ha- haven't uh, had that passion for football. So uh, I wonder if Don Stokes, uh, who's here, can uh, – you and Bernie can uh, relight the flames for me and um, start with you, Don, and I'll let you guys have a good show. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ralph. Um, I hope the most latest news will get you a little bit more excited, um, considering um, we just found out recently within the last uh, hour or so that the Jets have decided to part ways with Mike LaFleur, the much maligned offensive coordinator of the club. And um, uh, Bernie, I'm not sure what you think about it, but how do you feel about this? Oh, they could not have made a better decision uh, except, you know, making one about the quarterback. But this had to be done. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, so do I. I think this was more like a power play that Woody Johnson came down with a mandate that you have to get rid of somebody's got to pay for the collapse of the last six games, and it was going to be LaFleur. And, um, you know, I think he'll land on his feet for the most part. He's only 36 years old, and uh, unfortunately this was his really first time being an offensive coordinator, Ralph, and uh, you saw the struggles that the Jets had as far as trying to score touchdowns, right? Absolutely. Exactly, exactly, because – you know, um, I'm sure Bernie just mentioned um, Zach Wilson, and we um, that's a touchy subject for a lot of fans. A lot of fans are in the Zach Wilson uh, fan club, and a lot of people just can't wait to show him the door. And um, uh, as far as I'm concerned, Bernie, I think they made a, a, a serious mistake in drafting this young man. Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, a lot of people voice that. I, I did not really know much about him, you know, so I just waited to see him and, and I've seen enough. (laughs) I I saw enough after a couple of games, but, uh, you know, sometimes you just get a feeling and then when it plays out to be exactly that and gets worse and worse and worse, I don't see how he can be kept as quarterback on this team. Well, I think he's probably going to hang in there. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I was just going to say the draft is historically a, a, a guessing game to some extent. Which quarterback did they pass up to draft him? Did they pass up anybody who's making an impact somewhere else? Well, they, they passed up on Justin Fields of Ohio State, yeah, and he, he's, yeah, he's doing pretty good with the Bears, and they also passed up on Zach, I mean, excuse me, Mac Jones. He plays for the uh, Patriots, and he's not a bad quarterback. Uh, he's more of a system guy, but he's not bad. So they, those are two guys that they, they passed up on for him. And, you know, the, most fans agree. They say that you, you, the Jets won two meaningless games in 2020, which uh, lost them the opportunity to get Trevor Lawrence, and we've seen That's what correct. he's done. Yeah. 
Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that doesn't give the fans much of a chance to not be critical if there are other quarterbacks doing well. So, um, um, yeah, I mean, um, Zach Wilson is the lowest ranked quarterback in the NFL the last two years that he's been in the league. So that kind of tells you how bad things have gotten. And considering that this defense, Bernie, was a playoff caliber defense, it's just that the opportunity to make the playoffs just slip through their fingers. Oh, there's just no question about that. Um, and the question that I have for you, Don, is if either Mike White or Flacco had played the season as the starter, they'd be in the playoffs right now, yes or no? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, okay, I could say Mike White, yes, because Mike White, I think he brings something to the table. He he, the the players like him. They they would follow him, but unfortunately, they had problems with the pass blocking, and he got hurt. Um, but Flacco, yeah. I'm not sure. Flacco is sort of like a a state a statue at this point, and uh, hopefully, Flacco has played his final NFL game. The odd, the funny thing about that is, and 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 it may be. I mean, the last couple of years, he never really played that much with the Jets, and he didn't have much to work with. So you really can't see a whole lot there. But in this game against the Dolphins, he had uh, the Jets had not a lot working for themselves either, and yet he did not play badly. Uh, he was under the gun the whole game, and and. Uh, and and he made some good throws. Uh, it's just uh, Mike White when he came in those few games before he got hurt, he was just playing like a guy who could have led this team. And and right from day one, Zach Wilson just has not had it. He doesn't see it, and then he didn't get it, and he made matters worse. And the whole team, you are 100 percent right. Uh, after he made the comment about. No, it's not my fault. I know that's not exactly what he said, but it's pretty much what he said. Um, the whole team, he lost the whole team. You know, they talked about it all over television, how he lost the locker room. And and the next week you see the team is wearing Mike, Mike White T-shirts. I mean, <laughs> you know, exactly. that tells you a lot right there. I mean, I've never yeah. seen anything like that. Yeah, exactly. And that that was the funny part about it because, you know, everybody was in love with Zach Wilson and during um when he was um going through his um when they were scouting him and uh he had the um uh, the the, um, the the quarterback thing where they throw uh and like he was he was doing that wonderful. Everybody was was impressed by his passes and everything. But I don't know if the coaching staff didn't really look at the level of competition that he played against. Uh, because, uh, you know, some of those teams were not very good. And uh, a lot of the throws that he made, I look at his college games, and a lot of the throws that he made, it was really just on instinct, and he got away with a lot of stuff. And it kind of showed at the pros. And I think he'll have a nice NFL career. I just don't know if he can rebound playing with the Jets. But I, I think they're going to keep him, to be quite frank. I think they're going to hang on to him. Well, from everything that they've been saying – it does sound that way, but it's just how they can't go out and get somebody, whether it's Carr or Garoppolo or even uh, the Ravens quarterback, you know, Lamar Jackson. You know, I don't know who's available, but I'll tell you what, uh, that that game, was it the Lions game? Uh, that game was, there's no way in the world they should have lost that game. That's number one. Uh, it was at the game where it only took a, a few plays where the fans started booing him. Now, New York Jet fans are not boo birds uh, on their own uh, team unless it's really warranted. I mean, I've seen it. You know, it's a little different in Philadelphia. <laughs> but, you know, when the, when the boo birds come out that early for their own guy, there's a reason for it. And the reason was the fans in that stadium knew 100% that the Jets should be in the playoffs, and he's the reason they're not. 
Mm-hmm. And that's right. and and when the rest of the team knows that as well, that's hard to overcome. I don't see how they can keep him, but but I hear what you're saying, and it, it, and it sounds like from everything the front office is saying that, that they're not going to get rid of him. You know, mm-hmm. I was saying they should have gotten rid of Darno way before they got rid of him, and and I was pretty much saying this kid is not making it either. Uh, it, the first year I saw him, and yeah, this year, I, I mean, you could see it, can't you, Don? I mean, you could. Oh see yeah, it. oh yeah, you could see it. I mean, I saw his struggles last year, and I saw him. The struggles that he has just making the simple throws. I mean, a uh, five yard out, and he couldn't do that. And uh, you know, a uh, simple square, and he couldn't do that. It's like, but yet he can run around and make plays and like look fantastic on some plays. But you can't live in the NFL like that. These guys in the NFL, the defenses, they're they're athletically gifted. They're smart. That this is not college where everybody's wide open all the time and. You know, exactly. uh, he he just didn't understand that, and uh, he's gonna have. I, I I think he's still gonna have an opportunity, but I think they're gonna bring in a veteran quarterback, like you said. It might they be, have. yeah. I think it might be Carr, to be quite frank, because although Garoppolo probably would be a better fit because of his offensive style, but he is injury prone. Yeah, he seems to be that. And and Mike White, you know, as, as good as he looks when he's in there, um, obviously he, he he took a pounding. And if if they can't if they can't protect him, that he's going to be out more than he's in. Um, I, although that would go, I guess, with any quarterback. If that was that was a rough hit. I got a question for you. Maybe you you've heard more about this than I. How in the world did they start him two weeks ago? And, after he missed two games because of the ribs problem, and then he can't play the last week because he has five fractured ribs. How in the world did that get by the Jets? How I don't think play? it got by them. No, I don't think it got by. It's just that they were desperate. I mean, they were fighting for a playoff, their, their playoffs lives at this point because, you know, they had to win that game against Seattle, and Mike White gave them the best opportunity to win. And I think that's the reason why he played, yeah, you're probably and you didn't right, see yeah. Zach Wilson. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, they couldn't play Wilson. You know, they couldn't. And I guess they and, didn't want to play. You know, Joe Flacco. But uh, mm-hmm. it, it 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 cost them. I mean, six. It's just a jet way to end the season. And how many years can you do this to your fans? Uh, another question, if I might. This is, I mean, we're going on 50 years of this, on because, and off. Because I believe, well, that's where I was going, because I believe we're also going to talk about, uh, for a little while, a game uh, over 50 years ago. But besides Joe, and I mean Namath when I say Joe. Yeah, he, Joe Willie Namath. Right. He, besides him, and has Pennington been the only really decent quarterback they've ever drafted? You know, they had a good – O'Brien was his name, a kid from UC Davis, which uh, was living in Sacramento at the time. It's right down the road, about 10 miles uh, Right, yeah, but but the thing about O'Brien was they had to pick – to take Dan Marino, who the Dolphins oh. picked in the very next pick, and they took O'Brien. Oh, okay. Uh, well, <laughs> about that. Yeah, that, that, that little, is the case. That little thing. <laughs> I mean, um, O'Brien was yeah. all right, but yeah, you know, but but they blew the pick because they could have had Marino, who was well, also from the same area of Pennsylvania that Joe was from. That yeah, would have been exactly. great. It, it would have been, but the reason why I I um, read the reason why they passed on Marino, just like the Steelers had a chance to draft Dan Marino, and they passed on him too. So, I know he was yeah. injured the, the last year yeah. in college, right? But yeah, but there were some whispers about him, and I don't know if they're true or not. And uh, there were some drug whispers, and he said oh, they, really? they're not true. Uh-huh. Yeah, they said they weren't true. But the reason why the Jets picked O'Brien for what I read. Was he getting bad drugs? 
Who is well, that? <laughs> <laughs> you got to remember, this is the 1980s. Oh, so, uh, I yeah. mean, that, that's a drug problem. Bad drugs is a drug yeah. problem. You kids at home, this is satire. I'm just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Uh, That's right. All <laughs> drugs are not good drugs. So, All drugs yeah. are not bad, but some are worse than others. Yeah. Let's put it that yeah. way. Yeah. Um, so uh, the reason why they picked O'Brien to get back on that point is because they felt that O'Brien was was bright enough to handle Joe Walton's offense because um, there were some questions of whether or not Dan Marino can handle the complexities of the, Joe Walton, who was the head coach at the time, because they had just let Walt Michaels leave, and his offense was, was pretty complex. So they drafted Ken O'Brien for that reason, which is kind of a strange right. reason to draft a quarterback. Well, yeah, yeah, it is. And <laughs> and he was not a bad quarterback. I mean, he used to beat the Dolphins plenty, uh, but but the Jets never really had a good enough team while he was there. Um, it's just – Incredible to me how they've blown so many quarterback picks over the years, and and especially the last ten. You know, I mean, it's just even from Mark Sanchez. That's probably more than ten years already. Uh, they they get and these high what, what, picks and they can't do it. And what's really sad, they've had great wide receivers: Altoon, Wesley Walker. Um, it just, uh, it never happened. And, and, uh, those guys spent entire careers, um, not winning. Uh, yeah, just like I, we spend, uh, our fandom not winning. <laughs> the thing is this, let me ask you guys. Let me, I gotta be, because this is it. You, you are 100% correct, Don. This defense is a, is a, Top grade. What was it? Top three the last time I looked at the stats uh, in fourth. the league. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, so fourth. they finished yeah. fourth. Okay. Yeah. And and if they only gave up thirty points once in the entire season, and and they won that game thirty one thirty. But that was a fluke. They never should have won that game against the Browns. But yeah. um, but still, uh, and they only gave up I think twenty four points or twenty seven points once. Everything else was twenty three and under. Here, and I don't think they gave up over twenty that many times, and so they cannot afford to waste that defense, especially with all these good young kids they have on offense. Yeah, and, exactly, yeah. That that wide receiver Garrett Wilson, he's really solid, and um, he's absolutely he, he should be offensive rookie of the year this year. And um, then they have Bruce Hall until they got hurt against the Broncos in week seven, and he seems to be a pretty good running back. So they got some, some tools there. It's just that he was looking old world before he got hurt. Exactly. Absolutely. Yes. Mm-hmm. They just so need the right quarterback. Can't. So they can't sit on that and, and, and start Zach Wilson. If they want to keep him, keep him, but he can't be the starter. I mean, that would just be insane in my No, opinion. I think he's going to have a reset season. He's just going to sit on the sideline and – and learn because they're going to get a veteran quarterback and they, they have a playoff defense and this is their shot to make the playoffs. That's the most, that's the number one priority of this team right now is getting over the hump. It's been 12 years since right, they made right. the playoffs. And something else you brought up too about where he came from in college. I mean, uh, that was, that's a nothing league. You're right. In that league, the guys are open all over the place. So uh, I, I, I question uh, I don't know how long the front office has been in place because I, I kind of gotten uh, away from the, from the Jets for a while too, but, you know. But I've been back and I keep tabs. I've always been a Jet fan since their existence, so it's just that I don't know about the front office right now how long they've been there. But they keep making these same mistakes. Over and over again, how can all the different people that they bring in and out over the years keep doing the same thing? Mm. Well, the, okay. the only thing I can uh, compare it to. Sorry to cut you off, Ralph. The, no, no, the no, only no. thing. The only thing I can compare it to is the fact that um, we, as a fan base, is very, very hungry for a winner, and we're running out of patience. A lot of us are getting older. 
Exactly. So, you know, yeah. you know, the date, yeah, the name of years are disappearing in our head. So it's kind of like, okay, what are we going to do now? Now go ahead, Ralph. I was just going to say, looking to, to the future a little bit, I thought you were done. Um, in the upcoming draft, quarterbacks notwithstanding, don't talk about quarterbacks. Is there anybody out there or any position first that really could use some upgrade? And is there anybody out there that's gettable that, um, that can give them that upgrade in the up, in the next draft? Well, I'm not a big draft guru, but I can tell you the position that they need to upgrade on, and uh, that is at okay. center. They 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 need a center in the worst way. I understand their center is a free agent. Uh, I think his name is Connor McGovern. He's he's going to be a free agent, and they need to upgrade their offensive line. That's a that's an imperative. Absolutely. I mean. Yeah, because they've had difficulties with that the last couple of years. And they don't give up a lot of sacks, but they they can't run the ball very consistently unless they have a real breakout speed guy in, like, in Breeze Hall. And once he went down, that kind of killed the running game because, you know, ironically, he only played seven games and he wound up leading the team in rushing, which is amazing considering they played 17 games. So that means nobody well, – yeah, the- yeah. The run game went down the drain real fast. Exactly. And without the run game, no one's going to respect the pass. And uh, as you saw, uh, the Jets had trouble getting the ball downfield. And a, a microcosm is that game that they just played on Sunday. Flacco didn't have a bad game, but he threw the ball 17 times to one guy. And that was Garrett Wilson. Yeah, so he only yeah. threw 33 passes the entire game, but he, 17 of them went to one guy. So what yeah, does that tell you? Well, yeah. here's the thing. Number one, you, me, and everybody who watches football knew that in the Lions game, and then again in this Dolphins game, and I guess you might as well throw in the Seattle game too, that they're going to stop the run because the Jets can't run. So they're going to force the quarterback mm-hmm. – to, to win the game. Now, in the case of Zach Wilson, that's the perfect strategy because there was no way in the world he was going to beat you. And I don't, he could not have played a worse game. And then uh, it followed, you know, suit, you know, just followed through the next two games. I mean, the Dolphins were just keying on a run. The Jets couldn't run. And, mm. and, and surprisingly, Flacco wasn't all that bad under the, those circumstances. But he had no time, too. They were in his face all game. So they have to yeah. upgrade the line. There's no yes, question. Yes, they do. They had a patchwork offensive line that last game, basically. I think they had four guys that were out. And uh, Black Oak, bless his heart, tried his best. But it just it, it didn't look very good. And, you know, we only scored six points against the Dolphins. Not that the Dolphins are terrible, but their defense, they give up like 350 points this year. So, I mean, what does that tell you? Their defense isn't very good. But right. uh, the season's over. They decided to part ways with Michael Floor, and um, you know nothing against the guy, but I think the job was a bit too much for him. I and mean, he's a young man, and you had a rookie head coach in Robert Sala, and then you had a rookie offensive coordinator. And uh, what is that? I mean, that, that's a and uh, then a rookie quarterback. So that's kind of like a recipe for disaster last year. And then it didn't get any better this year. So I mean, right? Uh, I was complaining all throughout this season to my cohorts that I that I talked to when the Jets are playing. Uh, and it was mostly aimed at the, at the offensive coordinator. Surprisingly, not as, not well, plenty on Zach, but, but he just, some of these games they lost. I mean, the Minnesota game, the Detroit game, as bad as some of the players, you know, well, the quarterback play, was those games were winnable, and some of the calls were absolutely ridiculous all season long. I all I did was complain about that, and 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 I think I'm not surprised that that's the first thing that happened. Exactly, exactly, and like you know, you look at a guy like what's his name, Braxton Barrios, the the, the wide receiver, kick returner. To me, he was yeah. on the milk carton all season long. He he disappeared. What happened to him? Because he, he didn't do anything. 
all year, considering that he made the Pro Bowl last year and he was exciting and he was an impact player. But this year he was just gone. It's like he got his money and he disappeared. Yeah, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I I don't know that they really put him in there all that much. Uh, Although there was one catch, if he just could have held on a couple of weeks back, they they win that game. Uh, Oh, the Minnesota game, yeah. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. He he just couldn't hold it, just couldn't hold it. But they they should have won that game too. Um, It's really incredible that they've beaten or should have beaten you know, some good teams this year. And, mm-hmm. and and here they are, once again, out of the playoffs. And, exactly. And it wouldn't be so bad if they weren't, what, 7-3 and three or 7-4. and four. At the beginning of the season, I think a lot of Jet fans would have been thrilled with seven wins. But oh. not the way it went down, though. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> go ahead. so let me ask you a question, Don. Yep. Brees Hall was looking like he was going to be the offensive MVP. I mean, you know, a rookie of the year or whatever you want to call it. That's what I meant. Um, rookie of the year. And, and and now Wilson might get it, but, you know, the, the receiver. But why was he – I know the, this last week the, the whole line was out, the offensive line. But what happened between early in the season and then after he got hurt? This guy was burning runs. He was – 50, 60 yard runs every game. He was looking phenomenal. Why could the Jets not run the ball after that? Well, I think uh, Breeze Hall kind of um, made up for the deficiencies of the offensive line because uh, he was he's he's so good. good. Yeah, he yeah. was so good and fast. He made up for the, the lack of quality on the offensive line, and that's the reason why. You know, he looked so good because he made up for it, but then unfortunately he got hurt in the Denver game and. They didn't have a, a, a feature back like that, and they went down right. after that. Yeah. All right. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. He's that good. But, that's that's what I'm I'm getting at. That's that's good for next year as long as he can come back at a hundred percent. I hope so, and I hope it doesn't turn out to be the case of another guy that we'll probably be talking about here shortly. Um, Emerson Boozer, if you guys remember uh, him. Um, oh, I uh, love Emerson Boozer. Matt absolutely. Matt, what, what a great running back tandem. And yeah. Mathis in, and Smolinski as in-depth and what have you. Um, That's a good segue wow. in, in, into that game. You know, uh, I, I, you made me look up some things about that game. And, and I knew it was a tough game. I knew it was two tough defenses. And I knew it was cold in Shea Stadium that day. But I didn't know it was that bad. It was, Joe Namath said it was the worst day for throwing the football ever. And and if you go by his stats, I know why he said that. But, <laughs> but, but I'm going to blame him on him because he's my favorite, you know, player of all time. Uh, and But I, I, I was shocked to see the stats. Even Dawson's stats were not good. He was... Twelve, what for twenty seven or something, and uh, and <laughs> Namath was fourteen for forty. Mm. Yeah, that's but a lot of incompletion. It sure is, mm. and and I watch a little clip too after after Otis Taylor finally. You know, don't forget it was six six going into the fourth quarter, and uh, and the Kansas City had the number one defense. And the Jets' defense is probably right up there as well. They were the defending champions. And uh, this was a hell of a game. And after Otis Taylor broke loose for 61 yards and then they ended up scoring like two plays later or whatever it was, the Jets needed a touchdown. And, and Namath had one floated right over the defender's hands into Pete Lamons, and he just couldn't hold on. And, and they oh. never scored that touchdown. But he... He could have held on. I mean, it was a catchable ball. Uh, yeah, it, yeah, it was. And uh, for what I've read about it, and, um, you know, your memories about it would be a lot uh, more in-depth than mine. Um, but, um, you you know, like you said, the Jets were the defending champions at that point. And when they came in, when the Chiefs came into New York, and they had beaten the Jets early that year, Um 
I think Glenn Dawson had lost his father just before that game, and he came back and he played very well, and um, then he went and he buried his father in a funeral. But uh, the playoff game was a little different. It was extremely cold, as you said it was, but I think there was like three plays, basically, that kind of sealed the fate of the Jets. And if you remember them, Bernie, the Bill Mathis, um, when he was uh, stopped at the one-yard line? Well, yeah, that was it. They had they had first down at the one, and and, and they, they didn't get they in. They couldn't kick it in. Yeah. And the last um, play on fourth down, he 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 rolled out. Joe rolled out, but got picked off. Uh, he was he was looking for Bake Bake Turner, uh, but you know I don't know I I don't know what happened. It it looked like. There wasn't anybody really in his face. I don't know what happened, but I, you know, I was in. That was when I was totally uh, involved with, you know, the Jets. I was 17 years old. I was a senior in high school. Uh, and, well, that was the year that they won the Super Bowl. All right, so this is a year later. So now I'm 18. All right, whatever. Uh, but I was, you know, passionate, which I sound now because you get me back you're bringing me back to my roots ralph <laughs> well <laughs> bake turner the name bake turner jim turner was the kicker bake turner was the end i can't get that stuff out of my head yet um i needed the um the tutorial in modern day jets really badly from you guys. And I can't tell you how appreciative I am that uh, I know, for instance, to keep my eye on the centers in the draft. And um, just some point of reference, you guys, this is your second time doing this. You guys are really terrific. And I'm saying that as a producer not as your, I mean, Bernie, I, Don, I've known Bernie since he was, uh, I'd say three. And <laughs> I, I'm serious. Um, yeah. the, the sound, um, and I remember, I have memories of Bernie's tenacity playing the chords on the piano. If you could, <laughs> How how young were you when you started that, Bernie? Seven, but I really didn't okay. start, you know, playing you know rock and roll until I was about fourteen. Oh uh, no, of course not. But you were you were into it like no other kid I'd ever seen develop his craft, and that's why you became a professional musician, and um, that's why you're able to become. And that's sports and music and anything you do um, that on a skill level really transcends. So I'm going to ask you guys, was there ever in the Jets, um, in the Jets years, which guys did you consider to be overachievers? And really got the most out of their talent. Start with you, Don. Mm-hmm. God, that's wow, tough. that's a tough one. But um, uh, if we, I guess I can just say the easy one, which is Wayne Corbett. Uh, he's probably the the guy who I think about. Who, um, who, if you look on, if you look at him, there's no way he should be playing. He should have been playing professional football, but. He had a nice career uh, until did. he got hurt. Yeah, until he got hurt, he was one of the best receivers in football. And uh, concussions are the only thing that drove him out of the game, but he just had a heart, and he had a heart and a motor. And I guess another guy that I can think of just to, to uh, end up my point on this is is um, is probably Mo Lewis. I, th- I thought Mo Lewis had a motor that – always moved and he he um he he constantly uh made the plays uh he he was a solid linebacker who had a nice career and i i didn't expect him to have that type of career but he did 
Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. No, I, I don't even really know where to go with that. I, I, I've just been wanting to to talk about Emerson Boozer ever since you brought him up because <laughs> oh, nice. N- number he th- was number thirty-two. He was to me. He was going to be the next Gale Sayers, you know. I mean, until that knee injury. But what a player! Uh, he was. He he was a thing of you to watch run that ball, and and it's just to talk about some of the guys that you've seen and that never were able to really go where you thought they were going to go because of an injury or something like that. It's really it, it's a shame to see. Yeah, exactly. And with Boozer, um, he, you know, he was extremely fast his, his first year, oh. and then he hurt his knee. And then he became a straight-ahead runner, and he had no choice. And, right. uh, you know, they, they got John Riggins, and it was just those two in the backfield, and he became a straight-ahead runner. And he had a good career, but we'll never know what he could have been. Well, was that, the John that's true. Rig- was the John Riggins later playing with Washington who uh, met Madeline Albright, and they had an interaction that was funny, and I can't remember what it was. Uh, who were you a secretary for, or something like that? Um, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think well, it was, was a Supreme was a Court funny guy. Yeah, it was a Supreme Court justice. I think it was a a woman. I forgot her name, but yeah, it was her. I think he said he was a little tipsy, and he said something to her. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it was a Supreme Court justice, though. How did the Jets let him go? I don't remember the circumstances. He just bolted. Oh. He wanted oh, out. Yeah. yeah, he was a free agent. And I can't blame him for taking the deal that Washington offered. He was making like uh, $40,000 playing for the Jets behind Joe Namath, who was the highest paid player at that point. Washington offered him like 275000 for five years. So, I mean, can you blame him for taking the money? No. No, and it's hard for no. for the people that might be listening to, to hear money like that. But that used to be big money. <laughs> exactly, exactly. For the younger crowd that here is used to all these millions and millions of dollars, that used to be big money. And, uh, <laughs> and, and he and, wanted, and was big money, given what everybody else was oh, yeah. making. That's true uh, too. The working, the working guy, it's. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily out of hand that the players get all they can because somebody offers it to them. It legitimizes it. They're not robbing a bank or anything. Absolutely. They, happen, they happen to be well, the born in there. the world. The, the players deserve, if the money's there, they have nothing without the players. They have to get paid. Right. And if the money's there, you know, I mean, it may seem insane sometimes, some of these numbers, but people are watching, and, and it, I mean, it's all because of the networks now and all. But even even when Joe Namath got the biggest contract ever of $407,000 uh, coming out of Alabama, you know, that was huge money. So right. it was. Yes, it was, and now, I, I, and imagine I read. How Joe, no, I'm just going to say real quickly how great Joe Willie would have been if he didn't have that knee injury at Alabama. We That's never true. saw him the way he was. I I'm sorry move, to interrupt right. you. Interrupt exactly. you no, 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 it's it's fine. No, no, no. I was going to say, um, okay. you know, he. Um, he played. He played 13 years, and he he was happy to get five. They said he was only going to play five years in the NFL or the AFL, and he got 13 out of it. So, I, you know, it, you can't you can't knock him. He did what he had to do, and he was he was bigger than just a, a, a player. He was he was much bigger than that. As you see, you still see him on TV to this day. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, right. And if I never knew my Medicare updated, I'd be <laughs> calling him right now. He's the man. <laughs> That's right. Uh, oh, I was going to say something else. But let me just tell you something, because I talked about that clip I watched before on that fourth down play in that Kansas City uh, Jets game in uh, 
the playoffs uh, the year after the Jets won the Super Bowl. He, after he let the ball go, so I, I, I was gonna. I said earlier that there wasn't anybody really at him when he let the ball go, but they must have been close because once he did let the ball go, he was hit by three big, gigantic linemen. At the, they all came down on him together, and I didn't think he was watching the clip. I didn't think he was going to get up, and the clip's like fifty-three years old or something. <laughs> he got. So he got pounded, and he couldn't run with those knees. He had many operations, and uh, and it's just, you know, their defense, not in that particular season, but most of his years with the Jets, the defense was terrible. So he was on on the lookout to run away, you know, and he couldn't run for many of those seasons. Man. That that is true. That is true. I mean, he uh, he had a very good offensive line back then, though, and he still did up until his last couple of years in New York. He had a very yeah. good offensive line. They they touched him very rarely, but, but you know the defenses that he played against, they all knew Joe wasn't running nowhere. So all they had to do was keep him in the pocket and uh, play play his own defense, which became popular in the seventies. And so they pick him off. So I mean, right, that's, and that's the what problem, happened. yeah. All those years that the defenses uh, for the Jets were so bad that he was always playing from behind, you mm, know, yep. which is part of the reason why, or if not the only reason why he had so many interceptions in his career. But uh, they were constantly behind. And the fact that they were always in the game was be- was because of Joe and the offense, you know, uh, but it's unfortunate that we sit here to this day still waiting for another Super Bowl appearance. And, you know, something happened today to remind me uh, that we don't have that much time to wait. Uh, <laughs> Jeff Beck passed away today. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I'm something sorry to say. Every day, something happens every day to remind me of that. This is yeah. sport, music personal friends, relatives, this is getting fucked. <laughs> that's well, the, it is. The best, yeah. That's the best way I, I can describe it. Excuse my French out there, um, but that's the way it is. And uh, Jeff Beck, what, what, uh, not the Grateful Dead, was it? Uh, no, well, he came out of the Yardbirds. But uh, Yard Bird. Yard Bird. he replaced Eric Clapton in the Yardbirds. And uh, when Clapton left to, after they did For Your Love, he goes, that's not blues. I can't be playing this. And he joined John Mayall mm-hmm. and the Blues Breakers. And they brought in uh, Jeff Beck. And then they brought in Jimmy Page. And uh, that's why now, the Yardbirds went out in Clapton history. Has played, Clapton played with four or five great groups. Cream was Eric yeah. Clapton. Um, yeah. What and a career. They had Blind Faith and Derek and the Dominoes. Unbelievable. <laughs> some some right. of the stuff that he was putting out. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Let me ask Where's you this. Better? Let me. We're on music for a second. I'll ask both of you. Why is it, why is it the Beatles get so much more kudos than the Stones. So mm-hmm. much more. I think that's pretty simple to ask the answer, really. Uh, I think well, the reason why they it happens is because their careers were, you know, their group was so short as far as the career was concerned, and it's easy for us to romanticize about something when it's, you know, it's not there anymore. The Stones, they're still together. The ones that are still alive. And I yeah, think, but the you know, main he, reason, the main reason was that the Beatles were first in everything. I mean, the Beatles, uh, everything that the Beatles did, everybody else was doing afterwards. I mean, the Stones, as good as they were, and I'm a big Stones fan. Uh, certainly, the earlier Stones stuff, uh, yeah. uh, but uh, the fact is, the Stones were a blues band and 
the Beatles did everything. I mean, the Beatles just the recording techniques. They they had firsts in everything, and and as the Beatles grew from a pop band into a more uh, sophisticated, you know, rock band and other things, the Beatles just did too much. And the Beatles had four, well, I mean, three great singers and songwriters, and they encompassed way too much for the Stones to really be considered, you know, an equal. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, um, I don't mean to I burst your bubble. To, I, you didn't burst my bubble, but I play a lot of Muddy Waters and the Stones. And um, on, on a regular basis. And there you go. Uh, now look, I love the I Stones, and I'm a big blues man. That's I. That's I play the blues. I love Muddy Waters and BB yeah. King, and I mean I don't want to just bring out the two top guys everybody knows. I mean uh, I'm a big blues guy. Uh, I drove my wife insane just listening to the blues channel on Sirius Radio. <laughs> <laughs> can we listen well, to something else you know but uh, well, before you change the channel of blues I want you to go to YouTube and get Muddy Waters and Rolling Stones at the Checkerboard Lounge I and have play, it I have the disc. is that yeah. great Buddy Guy oh, is it. in there uh, Junior Wells that's a great album and I guess that's what I mean about my ultimate uh, Rolling Stones. I see that I see the how prolific they were, and um, I'm turned off to their their petty hearing about their petty fights with each other. Uh, not that the Stones didn't go through that too, but um, they should have still they should not should have still. But yeah, they should have still uh, been together. <laughs> if if uh, time-wise, if uh, if the Stones could could have stayed, uh, then they could have. But um, just just got petty. Oh, the Stones were great. <laughs> to me, the best era was always when they brought in Mick Taylor. I mean, those albums they recorded with Mick Taylor. And and the concerts, uh, those were just phenomenal years for the Stones, and and they did good work with Ron Wood. I don't want to say they didn't. That Steel Wheels tour was excellent. Um, but I got to tell you the truth, for me, as big a Stones fan, and I was a heavy hard rock fan too. You know, I mean, Deep Purple and. Led Zepp, all that stuff, and Pink Floyd. I mean, I had, I was all over the place. Uh, for me, even Cream, when Cream came out, they supplanted them as second for me over the Stones. I was a huge Cream fan. Uh, yeah, I love them then, too. And then yeah. Pink Floyd, but the Beatles just had too much going on. The harmonies were uh, so sophisticated. The songwriting. Uh, it, it just and that, and they appealed to so many more people. That's why you, that answers your question. There was just too many uh, people into the Beatles for the Stones to to supplant them. But the Stones are great, and they still have a huge following mm -hmm. to this day. And on stage, you can't think of a be uh, a better showman than uh, Mick Jagger. I mean, that um, just the oh, dancing yeah. Yeah, and all that. You're a little younger than us, Don. Mm -hmm. who, who did you grow up listening to? Well, I was more of a jazz aficionado. I mean, I listened to um, uh, Herb Albert and um, uh, uh, the yeah. Yellow Jacket. Brazil 66. Yeah, and uh, that that genre, 
more so than I mean, of course, I heard the Stones and the Beatles and stuff like that. But by the time I really paid more attention to the Stones, they were like in the eighties, by the nineteen eighties or so. You know, they were doing those songs, "Start Me Up" and uh, yeah. things like that, which is a little bit more pop oriented. But uh, Stones, you know, great group. Uh, so was the Beatles. I mean, uh, I like the Beatles. I, if I had to pick one, I'd rather pick the Beatles over the Stones. But uh, like I said, I was more of a, a jazz person. Well, okay. I like jazz too. I, you know, listened to uh, a, a lot of jazz for a little while, and and I kind of got away from it. But I used to listen to, you know, Dave Brubeck and Bill Evans, and mm-hmm. I listened to Thelonious Monk, and then I'd get, you know, some sax guys and. You know, I, Charlie I, I, Parker, those guys. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I was more into fusion type jazz than um, you know, that that type like um, type. Yeah, I got more yeah. into traditional. Um. Anyway, uh, it, there was just so much to choose from. I mean, it's just uh, so many great. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I was a, I was a big fan of Pat Metheny, and um, I you know I I still liked him, so uh, yeah. that was my uh, my my flavor. Okay, um, hey, I, I'm sorry to cut us short. The time won't permit us to go any further. It's uh, comfortably zoned radio network, jets 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 in zone. Don Stokes, Bernie, Bernie Rose. This has been, just speaking from a producer, this has been a great show for me. I really enjoyed it. Thank you both. Um, uh, you could go to the NFL and be analyst someday. Um, <laughs> <laughs> play this back. Uh, you guys are great. Career, yeah. I'm telling you, second career. In my right. seventh decade, right, yeah. <laughs> uh, don't say it that way to an older guy. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you. Hey, it was great. No. Let's do it again yeah. soon. This has uh, been fun. I don't think you quite hear me on that one. <laughs> but um, it ain't good being old, but it certainly beats the alternative so we can have moments like these. Thank you both. Comfortably Zone Radio Network. I'm Ralph Tycho, the weak link of it all. Thank you both for being here, and thank you for listening. Adios. Good night. And yeah. happy trails. Uh, good night. The proceeding has been a Comfortably Zoned Network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.